Hello, and welcome to One Week, One Year, a podcast where we watch and discuss a year of film history every week, starting from 1895, the dawn of cinema. And this week is 1912. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Elley. I'm a film projectionist, and joining me as always is... I'm Glenn Covell. I'm a filmmaker. Yes, you are. Um, a filmmaker who... Uh, oh, we'll get we'll we'll get to we'll get to one of the films we made shortly, ah! uh, this week. Um, Indeed. So yeah, we're uh, we're a film history podcast uh, currently focused on silent films. Although you know, no special attention. It's just that we're going one one year at a time. We're going in order. Movies. So yes, <laughs> we're going meticulously in order. So it's all silence now. Which means if you're watching on YouTube right now. Uh, we're going to be adding in the, the films for you to watch while we speak over them. And if you are listening in a podcast, then you can follow the link in your description for a playlist that uh, shows all the movies. If you'd like to watch them beforehand, watch them you know along, on your own while listening to us. Because uh, we won't be able to show the whole thing most of the time. Because our discussion will be longer than the movies. Because we're getting into two, three, four real movies Four real movies. That's four quibbies. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so we're getting into longer movies, which is exciting. Because um, I think that we can start focusing a little more. Uh, but we got a bunch of movies to talk about now. Uh, first off, what's going on, Glenn? How's it going? Oh, you know, it's going. Mm-hmm. Um, it's rainy out today, so I've just been watching stuff all day um but that's fun i like watching stuff what you been watching uh, i started watching two television shows uh the nick and atlanta both of which uh, are i'm long overdue on watching mm. and they're both excellent nice. so in I've case the great things about both of them in case you're listening to this and you want to watch something that's not from the 1900s but takes place in the 1900s you can watch the nick and if you want to watch something that is not was not made in the 1900s and also does not take place then, then you should watch Atlanta. <laughs> Solid recommendations. <laughs> I was finally able to wrestle the Georges Méliès encore set out of the clutches of the New York Public Library because I, I put a hold on it three months ago and nobody was checking it out, but for some reason it never moved. And then finally they said, hey, we've got it. Pick it up. Uh, so, we're talking about movies from 1912. So this is, uh, you know, this is a, a history podcast as much as a film podcast. It's more of a film podcast. But we like to inject ourselves with a little context, a little history for what's going on. So, Glenn, would you give us the news of the year 1912? The news of the year, 1912. Breaking. The RMS Titanic has sunk after striking an iceberg on our maiden voyage. Over 1,500 dead in the wreckage of the largest ship ever built. The Xinhai Revolution ends the final Chinese dynasty. Enter the Republic of China. New Mexico and Arizona enter the Union, the 47th and 48th states. In response to growing troubles, the International Opium Convention becomes the first international drug control treaty. The United States attempted and failed to banish reefer as well. The patent for MDMA is filed. Initially created to stop abnormal bleeding, someday it will find its true use, electrifying the dance floor. Cherry blossom season now has two homes, as Tokyo Mayor Yukio Ozaki gives 3,000 trees to Washington, D.C. Harriet Quimby is the first woman to fly the English Channel. Only two months after her feet, her new Blerio monoplane crashes and she perishes. The Japanese emperor died, signaling the end of the 44-year Meiji period. The United States occupies Nicaragua as part of a series of invasions in Latin America to assert the economic dominance of U.S. corporations like the United Fruit Company. While campaigning, Teddy Roosevelt is shot in the chest by an assassin claiming McKinley's ghost summoned him for revenge. Teddy finishes his speech before he goes to the hospital. The Universal Film Manufacturing Company is founded, the oldest surviving American studio. Biograph actor Max Sennett takes the helm and founds Keystone Studios in sunny Los Angeles. Edison and Pate create home projectors and cameras in lower gauges. Home movies begin! Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. The news update. Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt, um, 
apparently spoke for like 60 to 90 minutes after being shot in the chest. He was like, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it didn't matter because he was campaigning and it didn't matter because he lost. So, mm. um, but and Werner Herzog just don't care. That is true. Yeah. A similarity. They both, they both can get shot and continue what they're doing and they both, um, massacre bears willy nilly. <laughs> but Herzog didn't massacre bears. He just made movies about him. That's true. I, I, I was just making that up and I completely forgot that there was a That he made a movie, movie. called Grizzly Man? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, the big news item of this year, really, yeah. is Titanic. The obvious one. Um, which, yeah, big big deal. I feel like this is the, the, the piece of news that people, from this era, that people may reflect on the most, you know? Mm. People love to think about Titanic. Yeah. And I think it, it uh, it's one of the ones that most easily kind of sets the scene of like, oh, okay, that's where we are. The mm-hmm. Titanic time. Right. In olden Titanic times. Yeah. You know, back in Titanic times. Yeah. Remember the Titan sick? Um, anyway, there were some bonkers Titanic movies. Or one yeah. bonkers Titanic movie and one and one regular one, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there were there were th- three technically, I guess. Oh. Um, oh, you're, you're yeah. counting the newsreel? Well, I'm I'm counting the the Louis Fouillade one, that I don't. Did you watch that one? No. Oh, okay. He made a movie called The Obsession, which is not about specifically about that. Well, it is specifically about the Titanic, but it's about more than that. Oh. Oddly enough, the most notable Titanic movie is the one that is lost and we can no longer watch because it uh, all known copies of it burned in 1914 in a fire. Yep. Um, but it was the first Titanic film released only 29 days after the ship sank. <laughs> yes, and, this is called Saved from the Titanic. Yeah, Saved from the T- Titanic, and it was co-written and starred Dorothy Gibson, who escaped the actual Titanic sinking. She was on the first lifeboat to leave the ship. Uh, yeah. And she immediately started working on a movie about it. She, like got to shore and started making a movie basically in in fact apparently um the uh so she was working for eclair and her boss uh found out that she was that she was on her way back from the titanic and like brought film cameras over to like capture her arriving even the moment that she got back that Um, is insane yeah um yeah, she she wore the same clothes in the movie that she did when she escaped the Titanic. Mm-hmm. If if that sounds like it was an incredibly stressful thing to do, I think that is a correct assumption because she, she immediately retired from acting after making this movie. Yeah, I, I mean, apparently having a nervous breakdown is is yeah. what was what was said. <laughs> Which, yeah, there were there were reports of her on set like breaking down into tears and like apparently. You could see in in a lot of the the film that she was still kind of traumatized oh. while shooting it. I saw I saw someone suggesting that it's like maybe she wrote the movie as in like you know they got her input on what happened, mm. but like mm. she was kind of strong armed into making it by the 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 company she was working for. Because uh, I mean, like what what a great opportunity for a. a, a for an unscrupulous film producer without scruple uh, so a film producer without scruple <laughs> uh uh yeah you you got one of your stars who was on the titanic and everybody it was the talk of the town so of course you're gonna jump on that this one is one that i really wish that i could watch yeah um likely uh sort of you know <laughs> mental health be damned on the film set stuff notwithstanding but I would like to have been able to see it. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it would have been really interesting to see, definitely. A Titanic movie that we did watch, uh, and is the first feature film about the Titanic, is In Nacht und Eis, or In Night and Ice. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, it's yeah. A, it's a German film, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> uh, what did uh. what you, you think of this one? I, I had fun with it. I mean, it is, um, 
it, it's a little slow, as a lot of these longer movies are. But I, I thought that, um, I thought that, despite the slowness, I think part of part of what felt slow is that it felt very verite in a lot of ways. Um, it, a lot of the beginning of the movie is built out of scenes of just crowds entering the Titanic and people hanging out on a on a ship and and the ship arriving and all that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, so it, it felt very period in a way that, um, a lot of these other movies, like they feel more constructed, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a fun one. I liked it. I did. I did notice that it almost felt like in the beginning, at least it was kind of trying to create the impression of newsreel footage. Mm -hmm. Um, and it kind of fooled me for a second into thinking, oh, this is actual footage of people like boarding the Titanic. And then they, and then they punch out to a you know a wide shot of a real ship that is clearly not the Titanic, uh, and I was like, wait a minute, nope, that is a different boat. Yep, it is the Kaiser and August Victoria oh. uh, that they shot on the German a German liner. <laughs> um, but still, it 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 creates this, especially having been released. I think this one came out four months after the Titanic sank. Mm-hmm. Um, it does kind of create this very uh, kind of grounded, yeah, like verite sort of, um, this is the wrong term, but almost like a found footage type of thing for the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The clover um, field of boats. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I did no notice in the intertitles it, you know, it sort of introduces us to a couple different characters who don't have names. Um, they're just kind of referred to as a well-known billionaire. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the first half of it, when it's just kind of people hanging out in the ship, it's, there's not really any conflict. It's not really telling much of a story. It's just sort of like, hey, is some rich people doing rich people stuff. Yeah. Playing Doesn't... some weird old-timey games on the <laughs> yeah. deck of the Titanic. Sitting on a, sitting on a, a pole and then necking, hitting each other with pillows yeah, um, there was another one where they were uh, there was like a line drawn on the ground and then a bunch of like glass bottles and they were trying to like walk on the line without knocking over any of the bottles. Yeah, Str strange. Um, it definitely focuses more on the 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 first class passengers than pretty much anyone else. Um, which is sort of an interesting. I don't know. It's like when I think of the Titanic, I almost my mind immediately thinks of the like upstairs downstairs of it, of it all. mm Hmm um of you know like the 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 class divide between different decks and that sort of thing and this other than showing occasional cutaways to the engine room it's pretty much just like this is a ship full of rich people right right i guess um i guess that the class stuff is sort of central to the james cameron movie i, I haven't mm -hmm. seen it so i i don't know um i guess it's like leonardo dicaprio is the lower class guy right yeah yeah it's a whole kind of forbidden romance type type story um, which works for a boat because you're already, you know, there's they're already telling a story on the boat before any icebergs happen. Um, that, that's useful. Unlike this movie, <laughs> <laughs> there is a little. There's some kind of cool intercutting between, you know, people sh sipping champagne in the lounge and then the crew, kind of seeing the iceberg and then reacting to it, and then we're, we're kind of cutting back and forth between those two different things. That's true. Yeah, they kind of establish some tension in that classic mm -hmm. titanic story way um, um and then we we get to see the ship hit the iceberg in as a, a miniature shot the, mm -hmm. uh, a, a pretty well done miniature shot i think yeah yeah um, i mean it for the time uh, uh something that i was wondering and i wonder if you have any input on this is that it, you know it looks okay because it's a pretty big mi miniature but you can still totally tell that it's a fake boat right mm -hmm. Yeah. So why is it that like movies from the '60s and '70s, when they're using miniatures, it 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 seems a lot more believable as giant objects, like in Star Wars or something like that. Um, but but it looks so like dinky and fake here. Do you, think, do you know why that might be? I well, I think the two main reasons why are um, over cranking the camera, so putting it in slight slow motion, mm -hmm. because bigger objects we perceive them as even if they're moving very quickly that they're moving slowly when we're being ah, from far away yeah um and that makes stuff like water also look much bigger because water is something that you can usually tell is small you know if you're seeing a little tiny like puddle 
ripples and waves it's like okay they're in a pool yeah um but if you slow it down it, it looks more like ocean waves and i think the other thing too is just miniatures got bigger i think mm-hmm. a lot of movies from the 70s and and since like miniatures from like peter jackson movies and things are enormous they take up like whole sound stages um it's just that they're miniatures of like mountains crumbling and things like that so it's like they're still you know 10th scale or something like that or even smaller but it's that they still give the impression of of size and weight because they are very big and heavy Uh uh-huh that's interesting i um man you just reminded me of um I don't remember what museum it was in Virginia, um, but it was like a like an aeronautics museum, and they had a giant, uh, or they had like the the miniature of the spaceship they used in Close Encounters, um, and it was probably like ten feet wide or something mm. like that. Super super big, really intricate. Yeah. Um, the 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 ship looks okay, but and, and so the ship looks okay next to the iceberg when it's in miniature, but. I thought that the shots of the the POV shots of the um, the captain looking out of his binoculars is yeah. like, oh my god, an iceberg! <laughs> and then and it's it, just like yeah. this little piece of ice in the water. Yeah, it looks like he's looking at someone's drink. It's it's uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There was some some fun 1910s acting moments in this of them seeing the iceberg. I'm like, oh, 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 oh just freaking yeah. out over it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh yeah this was like an hour long so just barely a feature i guess but still pretty pretty notable that they were able to make this in that short amount of time is yeah i think well this was also um the uh a 24 year old director and his first movie um uh and i guess he went on to make other things but uh one of the one of the people who did really from this movie who really went on to make other things was uh, one of the cameramen was Willie Hammeister, um, who uh, a number of years later would go on to be the cinematographer of the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Oh wow! Yeah, I didn't know that. That's that's very cool. Yeah, pretty pretty exciting uh, that we're starting to see like these real established figures. Yeah. I won't talk about it too long since you didn't watch it, but uh, Louis Fayad also made a Titanic-related movie called The Obsession, which also has uh, miniature shots in it. But it is, it's not a disaster movie so much as it's sort of a, a drama about a woman who becomes obsessed with the idea of someone she loves is going to die. Uh, a palm reader tells her this, and so she gets all stressed, and then her husband goes, goes off on the Titanic, and it sinks... And she thinks he's dead. Um, and then the, the palm reader was revealed to be a fraud at the end. Spoilers. Um, but so it's sort of like using the, ti- the recent Titanic disaster as kind of a backdrop for this, this story that it's telling. Which is, I, th- I think, an interesting way of addressing it in the time that it happened. But not, mm. you know, it's not a Titanic movie like we yeah. would think of one. Seems a little less lurid and like exploitative. Yeah, maybe. I mean the the entire Titanic sinking happens in a single miniature shot of just it hits the iceberg and goes under. And it's the miniature shot I don't think looks as good in this one. And mm-hmm. it's it also is sort of like the sinking happens within, I don't know, ten seconds. <laughs> it's like iceberg underwater <laughs> immediately <laughs> um there is some really good uh cinematography in this um there's a really cool shot of uh the main the main character looking out a window at the eiffel tower um this is framed really nicely and has like some cool lighting to it which is something we haven't really seen as much of up till now hmm. so that was an interesting kind of offshoot i guess of the titanic movies yeah um actually r- related to the kind of unscrupulousness of um <laughs> of these titanic movies um i have a quote from the new york dramatic mirror uh who were talking about the uh the original one um saved from the titanic uh and they were they were saying that it seemed really tasteless <laughs> uh they oh, said, really 
The bare idea of undertaking to reproduce in a studio, no matter how well equipped or by reenacted sea scenes, an event of the appalling character of the Titanic disaster, with its 1,600 victims, is revolting, especially at this time when the horrors of the event are so fresh in mind. They so, have a point. I yeah. mean, <laughs> making a movie within a month of a huge disaster like that is... Yeah, I can see it being pretty tasteless. <laughs> Having not seen the movie, I don't know how lurid the movie is, but... Yeah. Imagine if, um... Oh my god, what was that, like... Was it Nicolas Cage movie about 9-11? Um, uh, yeah, I think Oliver Stone directed it. Yeah, imagine if that came out, like, <laughs> aug- like o- October 12th, 11th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a bit, a bit much, probably. Oh, I guess one more thing about a, a night in, uh, in in night and ice that I thought was kind of a neat touch was that uh, when they were playing music uh, on, on the boat, they actually just showed musical notation on the screen, mm. which was sort of a fun little way of demonstrating uh, uh, that sound was happening. I mm. guess. Um, I mean, it's. I don't know if this was part of the original, but uh, the version of the obsession that I watched had that same piece of music when the titanic sank which i guess is what they were actually playing okay uh Hmm. as the ship sank which is uh a a a fun little detail i guess they're asking all the survivors like what music was playing yeah we gotta gotta be authentic (laughs) here um i mean speaking of feature films um yeah we 20 1912 is the year that the first uh the first intact American feature film was released. Yeah. And that is well, the, Richard the III. The oldest surviving. Yes. Yeah. Richard the Third. I think the other one might have come out in 1912 also, but uh, just like earlier in the year. Oh, um, okay. And uh, yeah, it does not survive in full. Uh, yeah, it's a Shakespeare adaptation that was shot in Westchester and Long Island, or not Long Island, um, uh, City Island in mm. the Bronx. Um, <laughs> Classic Shakespeare location. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's Shakespeare. Uh, what what do you think of this well, movie? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit weird because I feel like Shake, so much of Shakespeare is the language and this is a silent film. Yeah. Um, and they don't even use, you know, quotes from Shakespeare in the intertitles. So it's sort of just like, it's like you're watching Shakespeare through like a, a Shakespeare play through a window and you can't hear what they're saying a little bit. <laughs> right. Well, um, these were real, like a lot of them were real Shakespearean actors who were doing their practiced bits in front of the camera. Yeah. So. I think, I think that stuff shines pretty well. I mean, it's, it's very heightened and theatrical, but it's Shakespeare. Um, the, the guy who plays Richard the third, Frederick Ward, I think does some, does some good work in this. Hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I didn't think that they, adapted it in a particularly interesting way it's more just like yeah here you go richard the third like it doesn't really it feels very much just like filming the play without sound yeah Um, i mean they're able to get in a lot more locations than a play would um but uh yeah we've seen a number of like shakespeare adaptations so far this is maybe one of the i guess one of the bigger ones Mm -hmm. um but uh i'm not i'm no shakespeare expert but i guess like like his movies can be divided in between like his comedies his tragedies and his political plays where this one is a political one that's just about like palace intrigue mm-hmm. and i feel like that that kind of stuff isn't very visual and so it, it doesn't work super well yeah. on film the intrigue stuff doesn't the murders do there's a lot of murders in this one yeah. um that stuff plays pretty well on on film um while i was watching this speaking of all the intrigue and the plotting um, I was like, this this is very Game of Thronesy. A lot of like, you know, kings backstabbing and like vying for power and things. And then I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's because A Song of Ice and Fire, the books that, you know, are Game of Thrones, is based on the historical War of the Roses, which is what Richard the Third is based on. So oh. it, it literally is Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not literally. I shouldn't say. I'm using that word entirely incorrectly, but. They are both stemming from the same historical story. That's interesting. I didn't know that Game of Thrones was directly inspired by anything. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 
in the sense that it is sort of warring royal families uh, mm-hmm. who do lots of intrigue and murders. Yeah. I think beyond that, it kind of, you know, it, it adds a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was, this was one that was like, I'm glad I watched it because of its kind of historical importance, but it wasn't the most entertaining. No, I was I quite bored by it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh although i was i was thinking about the a lot of the outdoor scenes with castles and they had these giant sets and i was thinking like i wonder if they built these or if they just like went over the tap and z to tuxedo and filmed at the at the ren fair um but assuming that, there was a ren fair there in 1912 yeah. i don't know Maybe. that's okay that, that joke didn't land <laughs> <laughs> um all right what do you want to go on to next well i mean we're already in sort of uh, you know, notable American films. Mm-hmm. I think there were a lot of notable... This was the first feature film made in America, or the oldest yep. one that we can watch. There were some other notable, I think, firsts, or or oldest survivings, to be more accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, like the oldest surviving Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde film. Yes. Yeah. Definitely not the first, because we've passed over, like, three or four of them yeah. that didn't survive, I think. They've they've been going at it for a while, but this is the 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 earliest one that you can actually find that isn't, like, burned or lost. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, um, uh, oh, what's the, Th- the Thanhauser Company, uh, yeah. who, who did this. Uh, which um, is a... F- pretty short-lived new york based uh film studio although mm-hmm. uh, i was reading about it um and it kind of got me down a sent me down a wormhole about how um van hauser was one of the the few kind of east coast film studios um that relocated to jacksonville shortly after this jacksonville florida for the the brighter light and the warmer climate um and jacksonville almost became the sort of primary american filmmaking hub city uh but lost out to la there was sort of a, a brief time where they were both oh. kind of vying for that position jacksonville um <laughs> but uh there's a really good um vox.com video about about that whole thing um oh i should check that out you can yeah, uh yeah. link that to me and i'll link it to the listeners will will do um a little context about dr jack and mr hyde though i think we should say i don't know if we said it on the podcast before this was, or doc, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was the first live action thing I ever directed when I was like 14 yeah. or 15. I think you were even younger than that, right? Maybe. I mean, I was, I think I was like 12. When you we started it. it. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was Mr. Utterson. And this is another instance of Mr. Utterson erasure. Yes, <laughs> in, complete in Mr. Movie. Utterson erasure. For those of you who don't know, Mr. Utterson is the actual like main point of view character of the novella, the the strange case of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, by Robert Louis Stevenson, and he is almost always cut out in every adaptation, um, because the original is a mystery that you don't find out till the very end that Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde are the same person. It's like a uh, a big twist that they've been the same person the whole time, <laughs> um, and this 1912 film like most versions or adaptations completely ignores that and it's just right from the get-go dr jekyll's the main character right and it's just about him kind of trying to hide his double life mr hyde his double life yeah yeah uh there's a uh, <laughs> yeah there's uh, it, was, it was funny because I've, I've never read dr jekyll and mr hyde but like i have i feel like i have a, a sense of the story beats from being in it <laughs> My, I mean, my my version of it follows the novella very closely. I, I made it was like a sticking point for me. I was like, I'm gonna do it right. No yeah. one else is doing this. I'm gonna do it like very very close to the actual thing. Uh, yeah, this one was I think based less on the book and more on an earlier stage version uh, mm-hmm. from the late 1800s. Yeah, the um, um that stage version. I think the actual original stage version maintains the the mystery aspect that you don't actually find out till. I think at least about halfway through that they're the same person. Mm-hmm. Um, but that the the play version adds the character of Jekyll's fiance, who is kind of a major character in almost every film adaptation that I've seen. Oh. Um, or at least a lot of the big ones. 
because um, mm-hmm. that gives it a nice romantic subplot that the original story is completely lacking. Um, and yeah, I mean the it's it like does... Frankenstein's fiance in the, yeah, in the Frankenstein yeah. movie from two years ago. Um, uh, they there's a pretty decent makeup and performance, I think, by uh, James Cruz who plays you know the the dual role. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think he does does a pretty good job, like playing the two different characters, or you know, two different people. Uh, yeah, well. yeah. I mean, the, it's funny the way that Mister Hyde is evil in this is that he just kind of goes around pushing people and and looking menacing. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of how he is in the novella too, <laughs> until he until he does a murder. Yeah. Um, he's, yeah, he's just a gnarly looking dude who people like fear, and yeah. then he murders them. Yeah. Um, this, the the biggest departure from this uh, novella that I did not appreciate was Poole, the best character, who is Jekyll's butler, doesn't yeah. even get to chop the door down at the end. That's like yeah. his big moment. You give he they give the axe to Ad, uh, to Alan instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I. I was constantly comparing everyone's performances in this movie to my friends when they were 12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was a fun one. It was, yeah. Um, um, I'm glad we finally got to watch one of these early Jekyll and Hyde movies. Yeah. Um, we, we mentioned in the news segment that uh, Keystone Studios was founded. Mm-hmm. Uh, by uh, Max Sennett. Max and... Sennett, which is a yeah. great old-timey name. Yes. Um, he's popped up in a couple of comedies, I think, by uh, D.W. Uh, D. Griffith. Did he do any... Com- he hasn't really done comedies. Uh, he did the, not really. the, the hat movie. Yeah. Um, I think I... I don't even remember. I wrote I wrote somewhere in my notes that, like, hats are the only thing that D.W. is, is not deadly serious about. Um, pretty much. Uh, so the first Keystone film... Um, that was shot, though it wasn't the first released. Uh, even though Keystone is kind of most well known as one of the early LA based film studios, uh, the first movie is at Coney Island. Mm. Um, which I guess they probably filmed on the East Coast before they relocated. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's shot in Coney Island and it's 1912 Coney Island, so it looks completely different and very wild. Yeah, yeah super cool. On, on July 4th, no less. There are Coney no. Island. Uh, there's lots of weird rides. Uh, there are no plastic bags anywhere. It's unrecognizable. Um, um, and yeah, it's it's not really anything that special, but it is. I think it's kind of a good example of the kind of comedies that Keystone would become famous for, of just mm. like wild slapstick chase silliness. Yeah, and this is another love triangle of two guys this, fighting over a woman. This is like a love hexagon or something. There's just uh, yeah, like, there's, I guess there's a couple more. <laughs> yeah, Max Sennett and Mabel Norman both uh, co-star, as they often did. Yeah, it's it's one of those, it's just people running around Coney Island causing mischief, I guess. The plot of it is pretty thin. <laughs> yeah, I, it was a little actually tough to follow exactly what the action was i vaguely knew it was happening but yeah. like it got a little complex i guess uh, although it was yeah my favorite part of it was seeing all of the old timey rides that they had yeah. which which included like these ones where you this one that looked so so fun which is where there's like a slide and you slide down onto these like super fast rotating yeah. metal discs um and then they just sling you about in various directions uh and i guess they kept doing that until too many kids lost teeth or something i just yeah every single ride in this that existed in 1912 i'm like this looks very fun and extremely dangerous (laughs) the spinning discs things i'm like someone got their like coat caught in one of these discs and it oh my god (laughs) i'm i'm sure that killed someone this probably existed until someone died and then they had to close it (laughs) isn't it appropriately coney island that uh yeah you know, it went. It kept going until somebody died, and they're yeah. like, eh, "I guess I'll change it." Hey, cyclone still going. No one's di- has anyone died on the cyclone? They probably have. But... I don't know. Um, amusement park deaths are are kind of interesting. Have you but been when, on the cyclone? When was this? Uh, I don't remember. 
I've only really spent like one day at Coney Island. I know I did that roller that um Ferris wheel where you kind of slide back and forth on it. Uh, oh, okay. I, I must have done the cyclone, right? Maybe it was. I might have been closed when I was there. I don't oh. remember doing it, does, it. They they close it a lot. Um, oh. I think because it is sort of like. This has to be working in perfect order, or you will die. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I mean, uh, I watched a, another Keystone comedy. Um, this this one filmed in L.A. called Mabel's Adventures, just because I wanted to get a, a, a better sense of, like, Mabel Normand is kind of the, the Keystone star at this point. Until um, next year, when Charlie Chaplin... Uh, yeah. Or two years from now, I guess, um, when Charlie Chaplin really starts out. I do think it's funny that a lot of these early comedies are just the actor's name. You know, it's like all the Max yeah. Linder movies are like, Max is afraid of water. And this is just Mabel's adventures. Like they yeah. don't, they don't really give them titles so much. It's just like, this is what the actor's going to do in this one. You know, I mean, I guess it's better than before where people were just the biograph girl or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, at this er- dash through the clouds, which also had Mabel Norman, um, was, uh, she played a character named Martha um, so I guess at one point they were like, let's just, let's just name her. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, I guess Max is a, as a pseudonym, but it, it at least became what he was known by. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, yeah, speaking of both Max Linder and Charlie Chaplin, I feel like this movie kind of fits squarely between them a little bit. Like it definitely feels like it owes a lot to Max Linder, even though it oftentimes, feels like the actors in this are kind of trying a little too hard to be funny <laughs> uh i feel like max lender makes it look very easy yeah and this is a kind of good, good example of how hard that is like how hard it is to do proper slapstick because this movie is full of wacky slapstick stuff and very very little of it made made me laugh <laughs> right and it's also really convoluted i think i think that yeah uh, the, the stuff that's really worked well with Max Linder is the stuff that's it's very clear what's happening mm-hmm. uh, so that you can you're not you're not spending moments like bogged down in a lot of complex visual information uh, you can just get good gags you know yeah. another thing that did stick out uh, in this one though is uh, Mabel Norman does the cane twirling thing that Charlie Chaplin kind of became famous for mm-hmm. so y- yet another example of you know other people doing that in comedies before him not to like take credit away from him but it's just like that was more of a a comedy staple back then i guess right of, like twirling a cane is, is what you do well one of our other uh kind of big directors that we like thought was just worth a, a light touch this year was uh, segundo de chamon mm-hmm. uh who did a couple he's starting to up his output again but i think he's getting close to on his last legs as well um, he did this one, Superstition Andalus. Or Andalusian Superstition. Yes. Um, which, it's funny, I kind of, like, it, it gets, it gets Chimone toward the end, but the first, yeah. like, two-thirds of the movie feel like, uh, like, a, um, like a DW movie. It feels, yeah. like, kind of, kind of realistic. Realistic? Uh, racist? yeah uh a lot of yeah. ho- horses running around yeah 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 it reminded me of adventures of dolly in a little bit uh, in a little bit just because mm-hmm. it's uh uh conniving evil romani people yeah um uh but it's so gonna it, do is like hey we have racism in europe too thank you very much <laughs> um though it does touch back on a, a theme that he has gotten to before which is that it is good to give charity to beggars Mm -hmm. um which um the basic framing of this movie is that a a woman and a man are eating at a diner and a romani woman comes up to them and is begging for money the the guy is about to give her money and then this woman like slaps it out of his hand and says no don't give it to her and then she basically like has a vision of all of the terrible things that the that would happen if the if uh if the jilted uh romani people uh would take revenge and so the the lesson at the end after the dream is concluded is uh, uh give them money you know <laughs> <laughs> he's making his point in the worst way possible <laughs> yeah um, yeah i mean once it does just kind of turn into a 
the Shimoni movie with like monsters in bottles, mm-hmm. it becomes a bit more enjoyable because then it's just like, hey, look at some cool effects and stuff. Yeah, some um, really freaky monsters in this one actually. Yeah, um, this actually has some of some of the best looking like uh, m- like double exposure stuff that I've seen. And yeah, like integrates like weird puppetry into it too. It's in color, which I think is more stencil colors, knowing yep. Shimon. Yeah. But it looks really, really good. Like it looks almost like a kind of um some of the like the newer color processes processes. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about the color in this movie and it looks so much more real. This this pathé stencil coloring mm-hmm. looks so much more real than the hand painted colors or uh kinema color mm-hmm. right yeah. kinema color which is supposedly you know it's based on the real colors that the cameras are shooting but it looks strange and fantastical and yeah. weird because of the strange technology but you're able to come up with real understated naturalistic colors even though they're fake mm-hmm. with um with the uh, pate color style yeah. and it was making me think because it had this dw griffith look to it in certain ways or, or vibe to it um all of dw's movies or, or D, dw's movies are generally black and white and sometimes have a little tinting but mm-hmm. um you know he goes for this real this realism uh that almost it seems like you could get even better doing this color method mm-hmm yeah, no, it's true. This one also has a pretty notable, I thought anyway, like film technique, which is it has a um, a dolly in and out. Yeah. As a way of sort of showing the the sort of vision or dream that uh, the woman's having when she's imagining all these awful things going on. But yeah, it's like her sitting at a table and then the camera physically like dollies into her face and we get a, a, a dissolve into what she's imagining. And then when she's done, we get the opposite. You know, it dissolves back to her face and then it dollies back out. It's not the first instance of like a dolly move, which as far as I can tell was photographing a female crook in 1904 by uh, Mm, Wallace McCutcheon. But in terms of like using it as more of a, like an actual storytelling technique, I think that's pretty notable. It was in photographing a female crook. It was just sort of like, it wasn't really necessary for like dramatic emphasis. It was just sort of like, eh, just move the camera closer. Right, right. Um, there was another movie released the same year that does almost the exact same thing. Um, this time uh, to go in and out of a flashback, which is The Passerby mm-hmm. by uh, Oscar Apfel. I yep. Think. Yeah, for the Edison Company. Which uh, isn't a super notable movie outside of that. Yeah, just just the fact that it's like, all right, we're going into a flashback now, and we dolly in and dissolve is, like, it feels so much more advanced than a lot of the other kind of uh, camera techniques that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. Speaking of cameras, (laughs) (laughs) I think one of the standout movies from this year is The Cameraman's Revenge. Ah, yeah. The Cameraman's (laughs) Revenge. By Vladislav Sterow. Oh my God! I heard Vladislav someone... Sterovich. There you go. <laughs> um, I I watched uh, another Vox.com video about yep. him. Yeah. Um, which very much helped with the pronunciation of his name. Yeah, this is all stop motion, which is very cool. Yeah, not just being used for an effect, but like it's telling an entire story with yeah. stop motion, and it's made with uh, real insects that have been turned into puppets which is a little morbid but uh is also cool the the plot of it is uh (laughs) there's mr and mrs beetle are both carrying on affairs and uh the cameraman in this case is uh, a grasshopper who is a creep um (laughs) and films mr beetle uh in a hotel room carrying on his affair uh, and then Mr. Beetle comes home and finds out about his wife's affair with an artist, and the Beetles get into a fight, and then they sort of make up and they decide to go to a movie, which of course then turns out to be the film shot by the creepy grasshopper. <laughs> um, and then it ends with the Beetles going to jail because 
Mr. Beetle goes into the projection room and has a fight with the grasshopper. Yeah. And then like the, the whole projection booth catches on fire. Uh. Um, the, the Maybe the first depicted nitrate fire that we've seen. Oh, um, yeah. Kind of, kind of uh, meta as well. I mean, this is the first... Is this the first, like, projector? No, it's not the first projector that I've seen, that we've seen, but um, mm. it was kind of neat seeing this kind of constructed 35 millimeter projector yeah. <laughs> being operated by a grasshopper. <laughs> yeah. The animation in this is insanely good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's like 10 minutes long. It's like a ton mm-hmm. of animation. Yeah. Um, and it's very intricate animation. Like, when the grasshopper sets up his camera on a tripod it's like he like sets all the legs and hand cranks the camera yeah there were full-on just like fight scenes between between bugs yeah it's um <laughs> uh and and also like the subject is super like adult too mm-hmm. um not even just in the themes uh uh but like you know uh, or, or not even just like what is being depicted i guess right yeah uh but um but yeah it's the themes of of <laughs> it's all these bugs just have very adult lives like i'm seeing a yeah. bug like pack like a beetle like pack a suitcase and get in a taxi and like go to <laughs> go to a club you know <laughs> it's, yeah i have yeah. in in my notes i have written down this is a bug's life after dark <laughs> <laughs> also to bring it back to the bring it to bring it back to the Titanic, I also have written down. Draw me like one of your French beetles. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I wrote that down too. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh my god. Uh, uh, yeah. The the reason uh, the grasshopper isn't just a creep. Like the reason why um he's filming them is because like Mr. Beetle goes to this uh, to the to the gay dragonfly nightclub, um, which I guess was a straight nightclub. Um, but there was a, a dragonfly dancer there, and <laughs> initially the grasshopper is trying to like chat up the dancer after she's done with her set. But then like Mister Mister Beetle like pushes the grasshopper out of the way, <laughs> and then takes her up to his hotel room. And so the grasshopper is so mad that he just decides to film them through a keyhole, yeah, <laughs> and use it to extort <laughs> Mister Beetle. <laughs> it is funny that. This is like kind of a, a seminal like stop motion animation film, and it's it's not for children. No, I mean I I imagine that idea hadn't been built up at this point yet mm-hmm. that animation is for kids. You know. Yeah, I was I was reading up on uh, Vladislav Starovich, and um, it seems like he is pretty heavily responsible for kind of inspiring this whole kind of like future line of stop motion animation supposedly willis o'brien was inspired by uh some of uh starovich's films willis o'brien being the guy who did king kong and lost world mm-hmm. who then inspired weird harryhausen and like that's sort of like the whole like history of of or a big part of the history of stop motion animation and film and a lot of his later movies also uh inspired later things like he has a film about uh foxes i think that is just just fantastic mr fox in terms of like the style of the puppets yeah yeah so i'm looking forward to seeing more stuff from him absolutely speaking of something that's not for kids something that's for kids uh and pretty good i guess is the land beyond the sunset oh i didn't watch that one. Oh, you didn't watch that one no so this was this was made with um in collaboration with the fresh air fund which is a, a a charity that takes like underprivileged kids in New York City and and lets them kind of go out and see nature and go live with like host families for the summer in in the countryside and uh, they have like a like a summer camp and everything and 100 years after this film came out I worked for the Fresh Air Fund. Whoa. Um their their camp is pretty close to my house and I was like a lifeguard slash counselor there in twenty twelve, which is one hundred years after this came oh out. Oh <laughs> my god. Um wow. Yeah. So it's 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 pretty good. I I'd say it's actually a it's a pretty touching movie. It's about this kid who um 
like he's a like a sad paper boy who who is barely scraping together a, a living and he lives with his like alcoholic abusive grandmother um and he uh like she gets a he gets like a gift from some passersby and she like steals it to buy more booze uh and eventually he gets invited on this fresh air fund picnic and like he goes out to to like a nice park and with all these other kids and he gets read this story and like you can tell that like he's really touched by the whole situation and um the story that he gets read they kind of flash like into uh the the kind of fairy tale story that uh that that one of the fresh air fund people is reading to him and it's about like a kid escaping from a wicked old witch and all of these fairies save him then they put him on a boat and it said he needed no oars because his fairy friends were guiding the boat out to sea along the path of shining light to the land beyond the sunset where he lived happily ever after so like you know they all get on this like all him and all these fairies like they get on a boat and they just sail away and super happy um and so this kid you know he heard the story and you as he's after he listens that you see like a superimposed flashback to like his horrible his horrible life and so as everybody's kind of leaving the picnic area he walks out to the beach near where they were picnicking hops in a boat and like sails away basically and that's that's the movie it's 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 quite it's quite touching i would say Dang. i feel bad for not watching it now i don't i don't know how i missed that one yeah, yeah, I, I think I might have skipped if it if, if it weren't for my connection to it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. I mean, just the fact that it's a hundred years exactly is is pretty nuts. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Another person who made movies involving children is uh-huh. Louis Guy Blachet. Yes, that I, that's good transition. I like it. <laughs> and I did notice in in her films from from nineteen twelve. I did kind of notice a greater emphasis on stories about family and children. It's nothing new in her films, but it, it seemed like there was greater emphasis on them this year. And I, it just made me wonder if that is like a reflection that in real life in 1912, she was then she had gotten married. She had children or if that was also just sort of like, she's making movies in America. Now we got to have the, the family angle, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, I mean, she was pregnant with her second kid while she was uh, making a lot of these movies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I guess that would, yeah, be on her mind. Not the most notable one that she made this year, but the one that I want to talk about the most because I loved it is The Detective's Dog. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were going to... Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, the Detective... I mean, from the title already, you know it's going to be good. Yeah, I think this is like the first the first movie that you watched from this year. You just jumped on it. You're like the detective's dog. Oh yeah. my god, <laughs> um, is great. I was I was reading about how it was sort of, uh, it's about a detective who brings home a dog to uh, to his daughter, but then uh, is is tracking a criminal um, and falls into a dungeon, and so <laughs> needs to get rescued by the dog. The whole being saved by a dog genre was already pretty played out. Hmm. Or was, like, a well-established, like, there were lots of movies about dogs saving people yeah. at this point. Rescued by Rover being a, yeah. the, probably the biggest one. Yeah. Um, so I think it's funny that I was looking up, like, how it, was, how it was received at the time. And even then, people were like, all right, this this again. But <laughs> this is my favorite one. Just because there's so many details to it that, oh, I just, I love it so much. So the, the detective is De- Detective Harper. We know that he is kind of a badass because he he brings some d- dogs to his kids and also carries two revolvers <laughs> the criminal that he's after is is the no good uh richard tool which is mm-hmm. a great villain name <laughs> um he falls into a dungeon he gets tied up uh on a like a, a table saw so that, that he's that gonna he's sl- slowly yeah. drifting toward the table saw. That, the that Richard Tool just like ties him up to this thing and is like, "All right, bye. I'm gonna leave while you very slowly get pulled towards the saw blade." I feel like that's heightened in such an Elise Guy way, you know? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the the actual ending of this movie is cut off. It ends right after uh, the detec- the detective's dog saves him. There was a longer ending, 
Um, but uh, it was just them calling the police to catch Richard Tool. It wasn't like him teaming up with the dog to catch Richard Tool, which is too bad. Pretty disappointing. But because that wasn't in there, now that just played out in my head, so it's fine. The thing that I think really stuck out the most about this is the casting. It uses all of like the Elise Guy Blachet players that she mm-hmm. casts in almost all of her movies, but for whatever reason this one they really like hit their roles really well. The guy playing Richard Toole is just like perfectly kind of shifty and like sneaky looking. Yeah. Yeah, um, true. I don't know, it was, it was great. There's there's a great moment of silent movie acting where um the detective's wife shouts, "The dog!" And you can't hear what she's saying, but because she's shouting it, it's so obvious that she's just shouting, "The dog!" Ah. Um, also, I I couldn't find that anywhere. I think it's lost. There was a sequel to this movie called Saved by a Cat. Oh my god! Te- <laughs> Detective Harper returns to be easily captured by criminals once again. Only this time, he gets saved by a cat. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. In that one, apparently he gets, instead of falling into a dungeon, he gets locked into a room with automatic doors that fills up with gas that knocks him <laughs> out. And I'm like, so much work went into these wild detective being saved by animal movies. Yeah, this very confident detective who just... Um, immediately, up- like, immediately gets incapacitated in some way and needs a pet to save him. This is also another movie where... Uh, s- some wife is like psychically knows that her husband is in trouble, mm-hmm. um, which I believe was in uh, was that in the Nihilist? I mean, like a Wallace McCutcheon movie. It was also in that um, uh, there was like a western from a few years yeah. ago. Uh, the, um, yeah, that that is also a weird a weird recurring thing in a lot of these <laughs> old movies. I mean, I think like you know their storytelling is still getting there, and they realize mm-hmm. that they can't just have the. The, they don't realize yet they can't just have someone go he must be in trouble right <laughs> you know? married couples do not have a psychic link necessarily <laughs> well where i thought you were going with that transition uh is is a, a much sadder movie about a kid yeah uh, which is falling leaves uh also by elise guy Blaché. yeah um, this is one one of her more well-known movies i think i got the yeah impression. and i mean deservedly i think it's fantastic yeah, it is um, very good it's very it's very sweet and heartfelt. Yeah. Um yeah, it's like a similar kind of dramatic or melodramatic fare that you would get in a lot of other movies at this time, but I think it's played so well in this. It's very mm-hmm. well directed and well acted. Um and the the basic setup of of it is that there there's like a family, a mother, an older sister and a younger sister and the older sister uh, gets consumption and she is uh, kind of on death's door. And then the doctor visits uh, to, to assess her, her sickness. Uh, he says to the mother that when the, like it's, it's fall at the time. And he says, when the last leaf falls, she will have passed away. Um, uh, basically in a poetic way saying that your, your kid's going to die soon. Uh, and the younger kid, who is, like, just unbelievably cute in this movie, um, she overhears that, and she gets this misinterpreted idea of of what that means. And so she goes out and starts uh, taking all the leaves that have fallen off the tree and, and trying to, like, tie them back onto the tree with this string. Uh, oh, it's so sad. <laughs> she wants to keep her sister alive, and so she she's trying to keep the leaves on the trees. Um, and, yeah, she, like, the, the kid is, is so good. Uh, her name's Magda Foy. Uh, she, she was called the Solax Kid at oh, the time. Wow. Uh, and she plays this character, Little Trixie, and... <laughs> and so there's a parallel story happening that was established like before you get to the family of a doctor who has come up with a cure for consumption and while she's out there tying up the the the, the leaves she runs into the doctor and the doctor uh comes in and and cures her older yeah. sister and it's very it's very nice <laughs> i did think my my one bit of like criticism towards it is 
the first thing we learn in the movie is a doctor has found a cure for consumption. That is the first scene. Yeah. And I'm like, maybe they should have waited to reveal that until later. I don't know. <laughs> um, there was a lot of good kind of dramatic acting in this. There's a lot of uh, solemn head shaking going on. Mm-hmm. Um, this is uh, a good example of movies from this time period using uh, filters, um, like different color filters to show different things. So, uh, day and night are are shown as either black and white or uh, blue blue filter for for night, which is funny because that's still kind of a thing now that it's like I just put a blue filter on it, it looks like night. <laughs> um, and it's like nighttime isn't actually blue, but um, filmmaker quibbles. Yeah, yeah, this one was good. I don't really have a lot to say about it other than just like yeah, good job. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I I I. Honestly, when she was t- tying up those trees, I got kind of misty, you know? I was it, like, oh. Yeah, it, it gets you. And I think they really, like, build the pathos in this by... There are a lot of these, like, really serious conversations about people living or dying happening between doctors and parents. But in the background of those scenes, you see this, like, innocent child who is looking around the corner, and you can see that she's kind of understanding, but not fully. Yeah. And uh, But she's very upset about the situation anyway very very Ugh. good yeah oh boy um another least key movie is making an american citizen mm-hmm. uh this one i found very funny which i think was the intention oh really oh yeah yeah i guess it was kind of funny just that guy getting smacked around a bunch yeah. um yeah. this is about uh, a couple of sort of vaguely eastern european immigrants who come to come to america and learn lessons in how to be american all of which end up just involving the husband not treating his wife like shit (laughs) like all of them are just like hey you stop hitting your wife hey you don't make your wife do all the work hey you like don't treat your wife like a a pack animal yeah it's definitely dealing in some broad stereotypes uh about you know, yeah, uh, I don't know Eastern European misogynistic culture or whatever, um, but uh, <laughs> it does, however, promote the idea that America is a place for gender equality. Yeah, which I mean, I think in 1912 the bar was pretty low, so sort of like, you know, not hitting your wife with a stick was like, you know, progressive. Right, right, <laughs> and I mean, this is coming from a recent immigrant to america yeah. who's making this movie and um yeah so it, it's basically a bunch of scenes of him treating his wife poorly and then uh, some good samaritans happen to walk by at just the right time yeah. including being just like lurking outside of his front door um <laughs> and uh, and then come and beat him up yeah and it, almost all the lessons involve the husband just getting getting thrashed by strangers <laughs> thrashed by strangers um which um, is very satisfying yeah uh at the end he's he he goes to jail he's sentenced for six months and while he's got a ball and chain around his ankle and and <laughs> is uh, uh he's just smashing rocks for, because that's what prisoners do he just kind of has this revelation and then the, the movie declares that he is fully americanized <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's kind of this movie is kind of like, uh, like about assimilation being a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, a movie about why men should be chivalrous, which I guess is the um, I don't know an American thing at that time. Yeah. And apparently there was like a a an Americanization movement at this time, um, hmm. which. Uh, like in the 1910s, there were like tons and tons of immigrants to America, and there was there was this kind of formalized thing to try and uh, make sure that they assimilate uh, from a couple of different groups. One of them being like the Daughters of the American Revolution, which is mm-hmm. sort of an icky group, but I guess um, I, I don't know. It, it, uh, politically, it's a little weird this movie, but I think that maybe yeah. gender-wise, it's tr- doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I guess another movie that uh, is is mostly a good thing is A Fool and His Money. Yeah. 
uh, A Fool and His Money, uh, which is the first uh, narrative film starring an all-black cast. Yeah. I mean, there was there was the kissing one earlier, but that isn't really a narrative film. Yeah, and there were those, like, kind of leering Edison movies about, like, yeah, you know, those don't a black count. woman, you know. Yeah. Uh, those don't count at all. Bathing her baby, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this one is, is, I think, very notable for having an all-black cast. And also for it being a story that is pretty independent from that fact. Like, the story is not dependent on race at all. Yeah, yeah, it's a story about class. Yeah, um, and it, it, it feels very much in line with Elise Guy's other sort of social satire kind of class-based movies. I do think it's interesting that the reason why this movie has an all-black cast is because Elise Guy initially hired, I think, just the the lead actor and a few others and was going to pair them each with one of her, her usual uh, white actors. But all of the white actors refused to be in the movie. Um, because they thought it would like denigrate their honor or some shit Um, and so she was like alright and just hired more black actors to replace them (laughs) Eliski is just the best she's 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 so cool like (laughs) (laughs) you know you you find out like all of these uh, actors and directors that later they're palling around with fascists and Eliski is just super progressive casually um in 1912 yeah so many filmmakers from this time like the more i learn about them the lower opinion of them i have and Eliski is the opposite i was just i was just uh, uh semi-related i was just seeing someone talking about how on the uh chanel website they have like a timeline of the chanel company and it glosses right over 1940 <laughs> to 1944 uh, um, some other stuff happened and then you know <laughs> which i wasn't aware that the, uh, sh- the founder of chanel was uh, an operative well like act as acted as a nazi right. operative like a yeah. spy or something so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah this movie um it's, its original title was called dark town aristocrats which is less Worse less good (laughs) yeah it it is it is very much still a film of its time i think like yeah it definitely doesn't play as progressive now um i think there is there is still a degree of of caricature going on especially in the ways of speaking of the characters Mm -hmm. yeah whenever we see not in in the intertitles uh but anytime there's writ there's like something someone's written yeah um, it's in kind of broken English, which is not, not a great look. Yeah, it's like this really like exaggerated AAVE. Um, eh. but <laughs> other than that, yeah. Um, I do think the like the the actual broad story it's telling about, uh, like how people treat treat people differently depending on on money. Yeah. Uh, sort of gets gets at a pretty real truth that is still pretty relevant. And it's it's also it's this is one of the few films to kind of I feel like all of the other American films have come from a very specific viewpoint, whereas this is actually kind of depicting America more as it actually existed, which hmm. is just to say had had people in it that weren't super white. That's true. Yeah, I mean, just by nature of the industry itself, there was a lot of like implicit or, or, or like. Um, byproduct exclusion of certain people. Yeah, yeah. So the basic uh, the basic s- story of this it's another movie about two guys fighting over one lady. <laughs> um, is uh, that uh, Sam's the protagonist and li- and he he fancies Lindy, and uh, she she fancies William Jackson who is very wealthy. Uh, he he sulks. And finds a wallet on the ground, and then he's suddenly wealthy uh, uh, from all of this money that he found in the wallet. But he doesn't um, he doesn't want to like just give it a like. He seems like it would seem suspicious, so he writes this note that says that he inherited money from his uncle, and plans a trip to New York to make it like not seem suspicious that he suddenly got all this money. And on his trip to New York, he just buys 
he buys all of these, you know, fancy clothes and, you know, nice, nice objects. And including from the money that he found in a wallet, buys an entire <laughs> car. <laughs> um, and that was uh, apparently Elise Guy's car that he was driving. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> he he and, drives by Lindy's house twice. Yeah. Which is Elise Guy's house, actually. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. That's yeah. cool. Um, and so suddenly Lindy is, is interested in him because he, he's driving around in this fancy automobile. Literally, like, so pathetic, though. Like, you know, he gets the car and then he just drives back and forth in yeah. front of her house. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, a very high schooler move. Yeah. And then, you know, because a fool and his money are easily parted, is, I believe, the phrase. Mm. Um uh william jackson oh my god and when when he t- when she picks him again over william jackson he will let you see you see him uh you see william like just staring in the window just like glaring <laughs> yeah. at them which is so funny through the window just looking <laughs> in yeah um and uh, eventually uh william jackson uh comes up with a kind of gambling scheme to uh turn the tables once again yeah and uh and and so he loses sam loses all of his money in the poker game and uh and then goes back to his job of being a painter yeah and then the movie's over (laughs) it's a fun it's a fun little story with like honestly look like william jackson looking through the window uh like made me scream (laughs) (laughs) uh so it's pretty funny yeah but another really interesting kind of satire i guess kind of social satire that elise Guy did was algae the minor yeah this this movie i think made me kind of commit even further to my idea that like elise Guy is trying to put explicit queer coding into movies i mean this is definitely queer coded yeah yeah like this is the one where it's like all right this is not i can't just be like oh it's because she's french <laughs> yeah i mean i think he so it's it's this very like effeminate man, um, algae, uh, algae. He's who not a played, swamp man. Who but. was played by the same actor as the, the the gay cowboy in um, uh, Parsons. Oh, Sue. he. I guess he just plays gay cowboys. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I, it's it's hard to say like how much he is being made fun of here. I mean, I think a lot of it is the comedy is is making fun of him being like a sissy basically. Yes. No, it, a lot of the comedy is definitely at his expense, I think. Um, um although he is the main character and the movie does have does paint him as sort of the uh I don't know if necessarily a heroic figure. I guess a, a somewhat heroic figure. Yeah. Yeah. The basic setup of this is that uh the uh, he he's trying to win the hand in, in marriage of of this lady. So, uh, but his uh, her dad thinks that he's like not enough of a man to marry his daughter, and so he 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 says that um, you have to prove yourself to be a man within a year, and then I'll let you marry my daughter. <laughs> uh, so he heads off west to become a cowboy to prove himself as a real man. But he's extremely effeminate. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he he wears a lot of makeup, and uh, he's got like this tiny girly gun, and like these basically limp limp wristed, I would say, in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got like these kind of fancy clothes and and uh, and uh, uh, and gloves and whatnot. And when he arrives in the West, he actually like kisses the cowboys as a thank you mm-hmm. for uh, giving him direction. <laughs> and they're like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, he, he in 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 the western town, he meets Big Jim, mm-hmm. who's like this big, gruff cowboy type, and I guess come to an agreement that Big Jim is going to teach him how to how to be a, a proper a proper man? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And yeah, there's like a thing where, yeah, like Big Jim gives him like a bigger gun. That's subtle. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that yeah, there's a but there's a, a scene a little later on where Big Jim is getting waylaid by by some some bandits, and uh, Algy fights them off. Um, it's sort of like 
the whole kind of second act of the movie is them them like learning from each other and kind of coming to this like respect for it's like oh like we're not so different after all kind of thing yeah and i mean you know it the movie makes fun a lot of algae's effeminateness but i think that like there's a scene that happens toward the middle of the movie where big jim is like racked by his alcoholism Mm -hmm. and he is having a really rough time and algae cares for him and that's like sort of when he starts to kind of see him as an equal i guess or respect him um which i guess is is showing some of the benefit of like the more feminine side of algae yeah it's it 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 is another i think example of like it doesn't really read as progressive from a a a modern viewpoint but i think for the time it was pretty it definitely stands out from a lot of the other movies that we're watching in terms of like i don't know minority representation yeah another movie that uh aliski did not direct but produced uh is the sewer oh i didn't watch this one uh the sewer is is not a terribly interesting movie from a plot perspective it is uh, the plot invo- involves uh, street urchins who are forced to steal from a philanthropist. There's also chunks missing from it that doesn't really help the coherence of it. The philanthropist ends up getting kidnapped um, and has to escape through the sewer, thereby the title being the sewer. The actual sewer stuff is really cool, I think, for the time because it it's one of the only movies we've watched other than like a handful that really uses shadows. Hmm. Um, and so he's going through this whole, all these different sewer sets and the set design is really cool. It's kind of like, there's like painted backdrops of like vanishing point tunnels. There's like grates, there's live rats and like water in the bottom of it. But all the sewer scenes are lit in this way where like the background is lit. Then the, the middle ground is entirely in shadow and then the, the foreground is lit again. So he's oftentimes the, philanthropist characters walking from the background into the foreground and will sort of pass through this section of darkness Ooh. and get silhouetted you know it's, it's very simple like layering of light um but that combined with the set design really makes it stand out uh from a lot of the other stuff we've watched it makes the movie look maybe even 10 years newer than it is Wow. Um, thinking about I'll movies from 19, that out. thinking about movies from 1922 it's like they've really embraced this sort of like much more shadowy lighting style um i mean it's too long i think it's like 15 or 18 minutes and it it could easily probably be like eight minutes right um the whole movie is kind of an excuse just for these cool sewer scenes it feels like but um the sewer stuff is is really cool yeah i mean at this point solax is making like two or three movies a week i think yeah so (laughs) insanity uh, yeah (laughs) well you want to move on to the the dreaded the dreaded D.W. D.W. Griffith. <laughs> I mean, I I did think his movies from this year were, were more watchable. That's true. They were not about the Civil War. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, just make crime movies, man. Like, that's a much better lane for you to be in. He's not going to listen to me. One, because he's dead. And also because he's most famous for making a Civil War movie. But yeah, there are some some uh some some pretty enjoyable ones from him this year yeah yeah i um i i quite liked his output again i, I breathed a bit of a sigh of relief yeah after this. yeah me too i was like after each one i was like oh <laughs> um, um well we could talk about uh the massacre which right is the um, most problematic of them all <laughs> it's the most problematic but like I think it shows a lot of his chops that he's gotten yeah. from making all these war movies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a movie that um, I was really impressed by it, in comparison to a lot of the kind of bigger epics, the Italian movies, um, how this shot giant battle scenes, but made them feel so much more intense and personal. Mm-hmm. Um Whereas the, the the Italian movies, they just shoot two hundred people from really far away, and and there's no there's no it it, it feels like you're watching nothing be, right. in a way. Whereas I, I was noticing the way that there's a few battle scenes in this in this movie, the massacre, and a lot of it is composed out of these like sensibly arranged small scenes 
uh, within the battle. Uh, so you're getting a real sense of who is in it mm-hmm. and what is happening. And when it cuts to the big scenes, it makes those big scenes feel even more meaningful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so he's shot a lot of Civil War battle scenes. And so I think he's got a really, he's actually got a really good sense for it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the, this is maybe like the biggest scope of a movie that we've seen. It's yeah. definitely up there. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just the sheer number of people on screen. The fact that a lot of them are on horses mm-hmm. kicking up clouds of dust and like uh, shooting guns in in giant wide shots shot from like up a mountain. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like intercutting between those huge shots, which are like show you all this spectacle and all of these extras, but then intercutting that with the 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 stuff that's like right in your face or right in the face of the actors. Yeah, I almost didn't watch this one, so I appreciate you mm. uh, telling me to. The first five minutes of it, though, do feel like a comedy, which I don't think is intentional. <laughs> because it's just like a... Well, it's setting up yet another like love triangle sort of thing, which yeah. I'm like... I watched this one, and I was like, D.W. Griffith definitely like lost a girlfriend to someone else and just won't, won't let won't it go. Won't let go. Like, this for sure happened to him. Because he puts it in everything. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know, there's like, the setup of the plot is there's there's a, a woman living off on the frontier and there's this like military scout that wants to marry her. But then there's also this sort of uh, cultured, well-dressed city man, I yeah. guess. <laughs> um, and he ends up also proposing to her about five minutes later. Less than that, like 30 seconds later. Um, and so, and then the... The military scout hears it, hears it like from the front door, and kind of rushes out with his gun out, and then like sees them two hugging, and he's like, "Oh, never mind," and like puts his gun away in the background <laughs> yeah. without them seeing him. And then immediately afterwards, like she says yes to the other guy's proposal, and and they hug. But when when they hug, the uh the the man grabs like a bunch of branches from a a tree accident like he's sort of they're standing next to it a bunch of branches and he grabs onto the branches when he hugs her and it cuts away right as he's like realizes it and starts like swatting the branches away <laughs> but it like cuts right as that's starting so it's like oh uh, we don't need to see that yeah i mean i uh, uh i thought that the initial proposal was kind of funny because he asks her like do you want to marry me and go out west and you can see her reaction she's kind of like eh. <laughs> she's like <laughs> you know not really <laughs> And then she gets a better proposal five minutes later, and yeah. she jumps on that. Seconds later, like immediately afterwards. <laughs> yeah, she's like, "Let me step outside to think about it." And then... <laughs> I think two years pass through an uh, intertitle, mm-hmm. and uh, the the military scout is part of a a cavalry party that just decides to massacre a Native American camp, seemingly for no reason. Yeah, um, surprise attack, just these people chilling. And I mean, the movie at the very least kind of depicts the, the Native Americans as human beings um, with, like, babies getting getting killed in the, in the gunfire. Yeah, it really lingers on the shot of their dead bodies. I think it's, you know, not... It's not on this guy's side exactly. Yeah, for... it's not. It's not trying to make it seem morally justified in any in any way. Yeah. Um, but then the rest of the movie after that is sort of more focused on the the counterattack, the the revenge massacre, as it were, which feels just a little bit more. Bleh, D. W. Griffithy. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think this movie. Sp- speaks to what we saw in Ramona, which is that he has some real sympathy for Native Americans and he doesn't see them with as much hate as mm. he does black people. Yeah. Um cuz I think this movie isn't really taking a side exactly. Um Yeah, it it is much more in the court, sort of war bad film, yeah. which he also has done a lot of those where he's not really taking a moral side on one way or the other. He's just sort of like, this conflict is bad because it's 
killing people. Yeah, and there's a big battle, and uh, uh, the the woman now has a child, and before the battle starts, her husband has to go away for some reason, and so the initial suitor ends up um, like protecting her um, and the baby, uh, and uh, in in this very long drawn out battle, which I think is done pretty well um he eventually just like they're all kind of cornered encircled by native americans on horses and they're just getting picked off one by one until they turn into like a big pile of dead people uh and so he finally dies on top of her and she's like huddled under these dead bodies (laughs) and when the husband gets back he he thinks that she's dead and then he goes no wait and they 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 peel off the initial suitor. And well, then... yeah, there's there's a a really great shot where he's looking at this like mound of dead bodies, and then we just see a hand emerge from the center of it, <laughs> um, and they're like, "Oh no, she's still alive!" But it's the reveal of that I thought was was well done. Yeah, most of the other movies that I think we watched from DW from this year are like crime films. Yeah, contemporary crime films. I think we should probably get to the one that I know we both want to talk about the most, which is For His Son. Oh, yes. Which is all about cocaine. <laughs> oh, my God. I was so pleased with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this reminded me a lot of the, like, um, uh, the sort of moralizing anti-alcohol films from, yeah. from earlier. Mm-hmm. Only this time about cocaine. But weirdly, like very heavily focused on Coca-Cola mm-hmm. and the fact that Coca-Cola initially had cocaine in it in, yeah, in this small is like amounts. A, this is like a direct takedown of Coca-Cola. <laughs> it is. Um, even though Coca-Cola, I think, stopped including the cocaine parts of the coca leaf uh, in 1904. They started extracting the cocaine parts before they would put it into the, the drink. Hmm. I don't really yeah. know how that works. Like, what part of the leaf is the cocaine part, and what part is the soda part? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I read, I read nineteen oh six. Maybe nineteen oh six like banished it, but maybe Coca Cola mm. stopped earlier. Um, um, but either yeah, way, I, by nineteen twelve, it was it was done. Yes. Um, oh, where to even start with this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's about it's about. I guess like an inventor. Yeah, I think he's a, um, oh no, he's it's, a doctor. He's a doctor, and he yeah. he invents a a soft drink, um, called Dopa Coke. Dopa Coke. Dopa Coke. Um, Dopa Coke. And the reason he does this is so that he'll have money to give to his terrible deadbeat son, who just always asks him for money. Yeah, it's like, oh, he wants to provide for his son. I don't know how to do it uh, without putting cocaine in soda. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the son, of course, ends up becoming addicted to, to Dopa Coke, drinking it in the in the soda saloons. I'm going to keep saying it because I lost it. I lost it. <laughs> Dopa Coke. His... his, his... <laughs> I saw somebody talking about this movie and they were saying like I you know I don't think he intended it to be funny but it oh, no. so is you know No th- this whole movie is very funny and none of it was in- intended to be Yeah I guess in a reefer madness sort of way Yeah um And yeah I mean the the son naturally then becomes a like in a, like crazed cocaine addict from drinking <laughs> the the soda which I don't I don't know if anyone actually became like an actual cocaine addict from drinking Coca-Cola. I kind of doubt it because I don't think there was very much of like the narcotic cocaine in Coca-Cola. I don't know. I mean, it it, it might have contributed to the addictiveness. I mean, mm-hmm. and like this, like at least that's what the movie was asserting because, yeah. you know, there's this whole, you know, oh, Dopa Coke selling so well, but there's this whole... Uh, uh, I don't know, shadow over the whole thing because you know that it's for the wrong reason and these people yeah. are getting their getting their fixes and going wild for all of the cocaine and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, you, there's a scene at a, 
there there are some scenes that they keep re- re- uh, returning to at the dopa coke like shipping factory where they're just sending out boxes and boxes of dopa coke <laughs> and then you see these still people like at hotcakes a, <laughs> you see these people at a soda jerk and they're like give me that dopa coke i need it <laughs> and it's it's a it's a uh super popular uh, place and you see all of these people just fr- in a frenzy over it apparently at this time people were like concerned about all sorts of additives to sodas and uh like the, the caffeine and cocaine were kind of like e- equally scorned by a mm. lot of people um uh, th- this is a a drink being invented by a doctor and so i was like oh is this guy dr pepper you know um (laughs) but apparently dr pepper was made in response to this because like dr pepper's early selling point was doesn't have caffeine doesn't have cocaine doesn't have heroin or iron (laughs) yeah wow yeah i was reading about like the invention of coca-cola and i do think it's it's kind of amusing that this this movie feels so akin to the sort of anti-alcohol films when Coca-Cola was initially marketed as a temperance drink. As ah. this thing of like, hey, temperance is a whole thing. Here's a drink you can drink that doesn't have any alcohol in it. Just cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. The son and the, the doctor's secretary both turn into these just frazzled junkies. Um, yeah, with like gray like frizzy hair yeah and like yeah they bec- they age like 30 years overnight and so he elopes with her they start just living in a hovel drinking tons of soda <laughs> <And> <laughs> well, i think i think the the that's right the intent yeah. is at that point they're they're actually like injecting cocaine into themselves yeah that, yeah i forgot about that there's a there's a point where he starts like kind of pointing to his arm and he he was he originally had a different fiance and she finds uh, a needle, like he accidentally drops a, a hypodermic yeah. needle that he uses to inject the cocaine, and um, and he's like, "Oh no, I use I put it in my arm. See, so you should try it." And then she's <laughs> too freaked out. Um, and yeah, I think he like swipes from his dad a big a big jar yeah. of cocaine that it says, says poison cocaine. on it. Yeah, it says poison cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> when he's in this hovel with with the uh, the secretary that he has eloped with. Uh, he there's a point where he just kind of has a heart attack and spontaneously dies of cocaine, and mm-hmm. um, and his dad finds his body and and cries, and then the movie's over. Yeah, well, and there are some, especially right at the end, there are some, I thought hilariously sort of over ex- ex- explanation, uh, intertitles that are just like this is what you're supposed like this is what is happening and this is how you're supposed to feel about it like just so blatantly on the nose Uh, i don't remember exactly the wording of them but they made me laugh (laughs) this movie's this movie's a lot of fun (laughs) it is yeah i do think like in comparison to the alcohol movies i feel like it it kind of does a better job portraying what the actual dangers of substance abuse are because i feel like in the alcohol Hmm. movies that would they would usually i don't know i feel like they didn't do a great job of actually selling like the parts of alcoholism that are actually scary. Hmm. Whereas this movie is actually like cocaine is super addictive and <laughs> will kill you if you do too much of it. It's like, yeah, okay. That, that does track. Yeah. And like the acting too, they get all like fidgety and they start yeah. sniffing a bunch, you yeah. know? Uh, um. So the act, the acting was pretty good. <laughs> I mean, actually um, I was looking a bit into Coca-Cola too. And this is, this is like kind of more based on Coca-Cola even than it seems because the son of the inventor of Coca-Cola uh, was an alcoholic who died uh, after being discovered unconscious with opium. Whoa. Uh, so, so like, the yeah, it was very, like an, very opium, topical. an opium overdose. This was in 1894 mm-hmm. uh, that, that the son of the, the inventor of Coca-Cola died from. So this is really just the Coca-Cola story, but yeah. swap it out a little bit. For double um, Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also like it, it it touches a little bit on DW's kind of anti anti corporate ways in mm-hmm. a bit like um anti big company ways I guess because it it focuses a lot on the 
immoral decisions that were made for the sake of money. Like they didn't care that cocaine was dangerous and addictive because it made them tons of money. Yeah. This is um, um, a corner in soda. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a corner in wheat, a corner in rubber, and a corner yeah. in soda. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> Although a corner in rubber wasn't directed by D.W. Griffith. No. Had similar vibes, though. Yeah. Um, one movie I, I want to touch upon just kind of very briefly, kind of just to complain about it, is The New York Hat, um, which is another hat movie. Mm-hmm. 1912 probably being the peak of the hat craze. Hmm. Um, tw- 1912 or 1913, like just pre-World War I. Um, this is a Mary Pickford movie. Yeah, she's where, back at Biograph. Yeah, and she is like a, a, a poor woman who wants uh, a nice hat with a big, with a, just a whole dead bird on it, which was a real thing. Um, and it's this like, it's this very somber drama about this poor woman who like can't afford this nice hat. And then uh, a preacher buys it for her because he made a promise to her dying mother. But then like her wearing the hat causes all this scandal in the town because they think yeah. i'm not entirely sure why i guess they just think like it's in a like the the pastor's trying to court her and that's inappropriate yeah or like something. her her dad finds the hat and like punches it to death because he's like no no big hats for you <laughs> but the the whole thing is just this like if this was a comedy it would work so much better i think it's dw griffith robs it so much of robs it from so much of its potential just by being so dour yeah it's like this is a story about a woman getting a a big hat and then the town getting mad at her for it and it's treated (laughs) as this like it's treated with as much like intensity (laughs) as the cocaine movie yeah (laughs) and no one dies in it but it still is just like geez all right like it's just a hat you know if it had been done as uh as more of a satire it would have worked better the satire of hat culture you mean yeah hmm. um but dw griffith cannot do comedy so yeah and don't don't try and get dw to do satire because <laughs> you don't know what you're gonna get <laughs> <laughs> um the only other movie i think i have really anything to say about that he made this year is the musketeers of pig alley mm-hmm. which is a great title it is a great title although i i wish there were more muskets in it mm. <laughs> mostly um, pistols <laughs> yeah i i did like this one though this one according to moma and also youtube is often identified as the first gangster film which it is not nope we watched that one that was the black hand in 1906 directed by wallace mccutcheon mm-hmm. um it is interesting that both that film and this one were both shot by billy bitzer oh really yeah i didn't i didn't know that the other one was i mean i guess you could call this the first gangster drama because the black hand was a comedy about gangsters was it a comedy i mean kind of well okay it certainly wasn't as like dour and dramatic as dw likes to get but i feel like the kind of bumbling gangsters in the the black hand Hmm. where like you know their their writing's all scribbly because they're stupid and and you know they get caught by a a trick of people hiding in a fridge Um, (laughs) with a big window in it yeah (laughs) um i think i mean all of that is very true i think that is more just a sign of how dramatic films were in 1906 versus 1912 yeah yeah you might be right about that this one's got kind of not a convoluted plot but it all comes together nicely at the end but in the middle of it i was like where is this movie going it involves uh a married couple living in like a, a a tenement building in new york city which that that stuff is kind of cool like seeing a like a contemporary depiction of like poor housing in new york city Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i think it was shot in new jersey but um wait really i just i just thought that was interesting yeah like like all of all of dw's movies but uh they they sort of run afoul i guess of uh this this gangster whose name is snapper kid which is a (laughs) great name yeah and there's this whole thing where like snapper kid is like trying to put the moves on the wife but then she pushes him away but then like snapper kid later saves her from getting drugged in the like the gangster hangout bar um 
And then he, he also steals the husband's wallet. Yeah, the reason they're at the gangster's ball is because they're trying to yeah. gain some intel on... <laughs> on... The, the gangster's <laughs> ball. <laughs> all right, all right, boys, we're having a ball tonight. Uh, it's because they're trying to gain some intel on who stole the husband's wallet. Yeah. Um, and then they get themselves into a whole mess. The climax of the movie is this big, like, gunfight in the titular pig alley with, like, the snapper kids gang and then like the the rival gang and then he ends up kind of making friends with the married couple and they like kind of get him out of being arrested and then he's like wink wink i'll i'll take care of yous we're we're friends now see (laughs) consider yourself under the protection of the snapper gang (laughs) (laughs) pretty much (laughs) there's some really cool uh cinematography in this one Mm mm-hmm particularly one shot i would say yeah um, right before that shot, there is, like, a shot of the, the rival gang kind of coming through a door. And we see the, the, the shadow of one of them projected onto the door before he walks in. Mm. Um, which is a cool thing that I feel like we haven't seen much of that kind of foreboding shadow precedes a character's entrance sort of thing. Hmm. Um, but then, yeah, there's, uh, there's a really cool shot of, of Snapper and his, and his goons sneaking along a wall. And they start kind of in the background and as it and snapper gets all the way up right in the lens yeah um like an extreme close-up of his face um and we get not i don't think the first but probably the most noticeable like focus shift in a as movie. he gets closer to the camera you mean yeah 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 so yeah it looks it looks good neat. yeah this is also um uh, a movie by uh, with uh, the, the the wife is played by Lillian Gish. Oh who, right, 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 right. She's about to pop off. She's mm-hmm. she's she and her sister are going to be real big. Yeah. Um, her sister also appearing in this movie as an extra. Oh. That apparently it was a it was a big deal. There's there's a scene when Lillian is Lil, Lillian Gish is exiting her apartment building and walks past another woman on the street and they kind of look at each other. Mm-hmm. And apparently, people who saw this movie was like, "Who is that other gal?" And it's and then it was like, "Oh, it's their sister." Hmm. Uh, I'll just like briefly mention the unseen enemy, which is another DW movie, and it's the debut of Lillian and Dorothy Gish. Um, and it's another like Lonely Villa type remake. <laughs> uh, this time with five different locations that are being intercut oh with each other. Oh my um, god. <laughs> and the the one thing that I want to say that, that's notable about this movie, um, besides uh, that it is the debut of Lillian Gish and Dorothy Gish, is that um, D.W. Griffith during the filming was not satisfied with how scared they looked at the robbers trying to come and attack them. Oh, boy. And so the director, D.W. Griffith, whipped out a pistol and started chasing them around the set to try and make them be more scared. Um, <laughs> he was like yelling at them to, to like act more scared, act more scared. Oh and then he just started pointing a gun at them. Um, well, I guess that takes the cake from uh, Kubrick then in terms of abusing an actor to get them to look scared. <laughs> right. Yeah, seriously. Well, I think it's time for the sad part. It's time for the, it's time for the sad part. <laughs> It is time to say goodbye to Georges Méliès. Uh, <laughs> his last films. His his very last films. His swan song. Made for pate um, after he bought after they bought Star Films and no one wanted to watch Méliès movies anymore and they all tanked. They were all edited away from his control and uh, and and this was it. Yeah. Um, the the filmmaking in in Melies's last few movies does feel very kind of stiff and stagey and old fashioned at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, compared to the much more kind of kinetic styles we've we've seen, but it is still it's it's very sad to see. Just like he's he's not gonna make anymore. <laughs> 
It's um, funny. I mean, you know, of course we have a, a, a soft spot for Meliès. There, there have been other directors who have come and gone, like Wallace McCutcheon, who's oh, so dead much. at this point, yeah. uh, who we just kind of forgot about. You know, it, yeah. this, oh, there are no We're more still of giving these him credit. Movies. Though he did the first gangster movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, it, it it hurts to say goodbye to yeah. to Papa George. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I it is somewhat bittersweet this time though because he at least is going out with at least one like giant fantasy adventure epic yeah which i think is one of his best in years honestly yeah oh for sure um Um, and that is conquest of the pole yeah um and yeah it it feels kind of like a return to form a bit because i feel like the last couple years any movies he's done have been much smaller scale kind of like trick films or like little like wizard summons a a statue film you know yeah yeah um whereas this is like a a, like a full narrative it's i mean it's probably as big and ambitious as anything that he's done yeah i mean Um, it's the longest movie that he's made that he ever mm -hmm. made it's half an hour long um Although <laughs> it wasn't the longest, we'll we'll get to Cinderella in a second, which is another movie. But that was originally longer, and then it was cut down. Yeah, but yeah, it it's got a lot of um, it's kind of like a Jules Verne pastiche in the way mm-hmm. that a lot of his classics are. Um, it's got it's like a kind of a travel movie. Uh, it's it's an adventure thing. It's got some cool effects and and yeah. uh, stage work. A lot of a lot of like practical effects and like set stuff. Yeah. Um, I think Meliès is is probably most well known for his early visual effects stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe may this movie might be the peak of his practical effects because it has the snow giant. Yes. Um, which is a humongous marionette that I believe was operated by around a dozen people. Yeah. Uh, some of whom were inside of its head, uh, operating its eyes and mouth, and the smoke coming out of its pipe. Uh, uh, and then there were people above the camera with strings moving its arms around. Uh, it's so good. It looked enormous and super cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it like picks, it, like grabs people with giant hands. Yeah. So it's like you can fully see that this is like two stories tall. Yeah, um, it, it made me really wish that I got the chance to see the King Kong Broadway show from like a year or two ago. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, where they had I'm, like I'm the enormous. I'm genuinely upset ape. that I didn't see that. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a, I'm a huge King Kong fanboy. Um, although, my, my favorite thing, having never seen it, my favorite thing about it is that I could walk through Times Square and see King Kong on a big marquee, <laughs> which just made me so happy yeah (laughs) so yeah this is this is roughly based on all of the adventurers who have been making treks to the north and south poles um Mm -hmm. in the last couple years um uh this feels almost a little bit similar to uh the um tunneling the english channel how so um just in the in that it feels like it's it's very kind of contemporary like topical satire uh yeah yeah i would say so um um there's a there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh satirical stereotyping going on uh yeah that's not a not bit in great ways tasteful um, part <laughs> there i think there's a particular focus on suffragettes which it seems weird that he's like singling them out as as like silly and foolish yeah, I mean, I kind of expected better from him to a little bit, yeah. be um, uh, uh, using suffragettes as just like this the butt of a joke about how mm-hmm. uh, how they're kind of like let me be included. I I I deserve to be included in the movie. Going, haha, you're dumb, you know. Which is also weird because like in I think the Fantastic Voyage, like he has a bunch of men and women as part of this adventure, and it's like not addressed or even a thing. Yeah, and now he's making women trying to be included on this big adventure as like like Psh, no get out of here you you're you're ladies you can't go in a balloon. Well, yeah, I mean it's another kind of torn from the headlines thing because I think that in addition to adventurers going to the North and South Pole, like suffragettes were really in the news at this time. 
uh, I believe like this is around the point where in the UK a lot of the suffragettes started like bombing things uh, oh my God. Uh, to, to, to get their way you know uh, so it seems like the main suffragette is like based on uh, the, the kind of founder of the movement Emmeline Pankhurst um, and yeah like they were they were like militant and they were like getting in people's way which I think a lot of men I, you know I don't think Melies hated them uh, but he uh, maybe saw them as uppity <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the vibe I got from it a bit. It does almost feel like Melies is going out of his way to like skewer just every like any demographic in this movie. Like he includes We go so- after everyone. <laughs> it it does kind of feel that way though because he's just got like characters representing whole countries that are just showing up and being just the most like absurd outsized caricature of that country possible yeah big broad characters it feels like a kind of like goofy 50s movie in that way like it's a mad 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 world Mm -hmm. um of just like these just broad caricatures and and people all like a gaggle of people all like racing to get somewhere you know melies talked later about how uh, there wasn't any footage from the North Pole or, like, people who had, like, proven that they'd been there. Because I think that was a little mm. contentious at this time that yeah. uh, uh, people had not, like, fully proven that they were at the, 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 yeah. the North Pole. Uh, and so he said, like, I just made my own, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, yeah, his his North Pole looks like it could be the moon or Jupiter or, yeah. you know, any of the planets that he's he's gone to. Like, it's <laughs> it's another just sort of, like, fantasy scape. Yeah. Which is which is a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a bit a bit disheartening to hear this movie made no money and no one saw it when it came out. Yeah, unfortunately, because a lot of this movie is just so fun, so classically Melies. I mean, when you get past the the suffragette bit and when you get past all of the like racial stereotypes, which like there's there's one for America that's named Buff like <laughs> named after Buffalo Bill. Mm-hmm. There's show krautman from germany um uh somebody named cerveza from spain yeah i uh, shouldn't laugh at any of these they're all pretty bad <laughs> it's it's a kind of a postmodern laugh of how yeah of how racist it is <laughs> uh ching chun from china and kakoku from france um and then the guy or, or the kakoku from japan uh and then run ever which i it must be some joke that i'm not getting from england yeah, I feel like that's a pun that I don't understand. Yeah. Um, and he's bluff allo Bill, like hello mm. in French. But yeah, once you get past all of that, great, great Melies. Yeah. Super fun. It, it does feel like a kind of um, a swan song, a sort of going out with a bang, like this is his last big, like wacky fantasy movie. Yeah. Although he made three more uh, in 1912. Yeah. The next being Cinderella, which is his his second Cinderella movie. Yeah, kind of a remake of mm-hmm. of the 1899 one. Although I don't think I like this one as much as the the 1899 one. It's a little slow and it's weird. It feels very like for a movie of this length, it's um like 25 minutes. It feels like very economical uh even though uh it's all just happening very slowly. Like mm-hmm. it's all it's all plot stuff, and basically thirty minutes of this movie was cut out mm-hmm. um, because it was it was originally fifty four minutes, um, and apparently there were just all of these like side scenes and kind of like atmosphere and character building stuff that is gone now. Although it does it does almost sound like from what the what little I read about it, it sounds like some of the stuff that was cut out was more entertaining than the stuff that was kept in. Apparently, there was a whole pumpkin chariot race. Yeah, that got cut out. How this movie was recut is is somewhat contentious i think there is an account from melies's widow um jeanne d'alcy i think is how you say your name who later said that ferdinand zecca re-edited and massacred the film <laughs> she her her word is yeah. massacred yeah um and like deliberately tried to make it worse like ferdinand zecca was sort of like recutting all of melies's movies at pate to kind of ruin them Ugh, it's and awful <laughs> i don't i mean who knows if that's true but it's if so that's that's 
pretty bad. I I could see it. Yeah, I, mean, I kind of can too. <laughs> from what I from what I I get from Ferdinand Zeka, he um he seems like a bit of a straight laced guy who wouldn't who wouldn't appreciate Melies's tomfoolery. Yeah, he he cannot sanction his his buffoonery. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is there is some some really good stuff in this. I think there's there's a lot of great like costumes and sets, and mm-hmm. I think the chariot it, transformation is really good. Yeah, um, there are like imp children in this one, which I don't remember being final a thing imps. In Cinderella, final imps. Uh, yeah, and well, and some of the other some of the other movies had imps also. Oh, okay. Um, the next one also has imps. Well, um, uh, what do you call it? Conquest of the Pole also had his final moon face. Which, right. Was uh, it the moon in that one? I thought it was a different. Oh, sorry. Body. It is um, uh, Jupiter. Or no, it's Saturn. Right. So it's it's a planet face. Yeah. Final planet face. Yeah. Or a heavenly body face. I don't know. <laughs> face in a thing in the sky. His Yeah. Yeah. So the, the final moon face was last year, 1911. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, it, was, it was all right. Cinderella. Is, this is fine. This is the one that I accidentally watched in when we did 1899. Oh, really? And I was like, so, "Oh my god. This yeah. is so crazy, you know." <laughs> um there is a single sort of like medium close-up shot in this one mm-hmm. which I've I saw somewhere online, it might have been Wikipedia, that like that was Fernand Zaka added that in because it's like so so abnormal for a Melies movie. Yeah. Uh, there was also some brief, like, parallel action that was happening mm-hmm. uh, uh, with the, I believe, with the clock and then, like, cutting back to the, yeah. the, the room and everything. And there is suspicion that that's also Zekka's influence. Yeah. One of the, the, the other final movies that he made uh, that was also recut by Fernand Zekka, supposedly, is The Night of the Snows. Yes. Which is... Another fantasy movie, but like not really a fantasy epic. More of a a small scale kind of. I don't know. I don't know how to describe this one in terms of like his oeuvre. It's a little quest thing. It's like a little yeah. knightly quest. It's um, but like much smaller scale than uh, Kingdom of the Fairies or something like that. Yeah. Um, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, this one uh, had a working title that was the same French title as The Witch. Um, Oh, and huh. uh th- and so it does seem like of a somewhat similar scale to the witch yeah uh and i think you s- reuse some of the props too mm-hmm. um i think some of the creatures appear in both and yeah this is this is melies getting to play the devil for one last time yeah this is uh, his last melies as satan and movie. he he really he really choose choose the the scenery yeah. as uh as this <laughs> <laughs> as this devil he's like very chummy uh like kind of jokingly chummy with uh the the knight and kind of mm-hmm. uh uh he plays his yeah there there are more imps in this one of course because it's the yeah. devil but uh um yeah this, the the plot of it is kind of the the standard favorite hill princess getting kidnapped and then rescued by a heroic knight story mm-hmm. but this one has the addition of the kind of the main villain is uh like a jealous human man yeah um normally it's like uh a witch or a monster or some sort or satan himself whereas in this satan appears as sort of like the guy who helps the human villain but then at the end because the the villain sold his soul he gets dragged to hell at the end which is (laughs) is pretty fun yeah yeah and uh the way that he gets in contact with the devil is through an alchemist named alka frispas which suggests a Melies cinematic universe oh shit because <laughs> uh, we've seen Alka Frisbus yeah. before oh yeah I know the MCU the Melies cinematic universe <laughs> um but yeah Alka Frisbus is neutral because he also helps the good guy mm-hmm. um yeah. uh, when he when he approaches the alchemist for help and one thing that I was wondering that might have been a Zeka thing for this one is that, and which I think is actually good, is that uh, a lot of the scenes end like really percussively in this movie. Hmm. Uh, like the action is still going in a way when the scene cuts to the next one, um, which made it, it made it feel like a lot had feel like it had more energy. Um, yeah, 
uh, but it's definitely not something that I've seen Melius do anywhere else. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't really notice any big differences in the editing style mm-hmm. watching watching these. I mean, the the cut to a close up in Cinderella was probably the one thing that was like, oh, this is different. But yeah, in terms of like, uh, in terms of them being like noticeably different in their editing style, I didn't really pick up on it. I'm sure if I went back and like rewatched them, I I might. But um, yeah, and then the last one, the yep. last film that Melies ever made. Yeah, this one it's unclear if it ever was released. Actually, yeah, if it was, it was probably actually released in 1913, not 1912. But it yeah. seems almost more likely that it wasn't actually ever released yeah. at the time and was only discovered much later. Yeah, and it was it was all shot in nineteen twelve as well. Mm-hmm. And this is the voyage of the Borishon family or the Blockhead family. Oh, is that what it means? Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um and then yeah, this is another kind of uh it turns like halfway through it turns into a haunted hotel movie. <laughs> well, but kind the- of, except that like the the interesting thing is that it's not supernatural. Like like I don't I don't think, right? Like the, the the framing of this is that there's a rich family who is fleeing to escape like their debts and taxes and mm-hmm. whatever and uh the creditors get in touch with their servants and then just tell the servants to just make their their lives hell until they come back um and so there's a lot of just like pranks being played as is typical in a Melies film uh but even though some of them are using the same effects as in his supernatural movies it seems um like it's all in the story at least supposed to be um like pranks that their servants are playing maybe maybe that that's probably right i mean i find this one a little bit harder to follow in terms of the plot yeah i thought that they like ran into a haunted hotel and then they had to rob a train on the way back to pay off their debts, and but then their house was haunted at the end, <laughs> which is probably not the correct reading of it. But that was my takeaway. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think all the effects in this are things that we've seen before. Mm-hmm. But it, it is cool to see again, just like the way that they're integrated into the sets. I think. Yeah, for sure. I, at the beginning of this one, I was a little, uh, I was getting like a little bored at the beginning of this one, and I wrote down, "Was this one Miguel?" Um. <laughs> Manuel, you mean? Oh, sorry, Manuel. Yeah, <laughs> the mysterious Manuel. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's some cool like cross section uh, sets. There's the the when they're on the train, both leaving and coming back to their their home. There's the cool like sort of multiple train compartments on a single sort of cross section yeah. set. But yeah, this one is it's the last one, but it's it, there's not really a lot. That feels very special about it. Yeah, let's just consider his last one to be uh, "Conquest of the Pole," and then yeah, that one is is certainly the like the Melies swan song. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, that's it. After a decade after "Trip to the Moon," the end for Melies. Yeah. Um, and the end to our podcast. <laughs> what was your favorite, Glenn? Um, I mean, the detective's dog. <laughs> I didn't think it was the best movie of the year, but it was the one that I enjoyed the most. I feel like the best movie to me was Falling Leaves, but I feel like I have to go with the goofy picks every time. And so (laughs) it's got to be for his son. Yeah. It's got to be, right? (laughs) Honorable mention to The Cameraman's Revenge, I think. I really like that one a lot. Yes. Yeah, that one was really good. Um, Okay. Well. If you made it this far through the podcast, thanks for listening. We're gonna we're moving on to the era of feature films very soon, and so we're gonna be talking about like a much more restricted amount of things soon. I think. Yeah. If you uh, are interested in what we're doing, uh, which I assume you are at this point, uh, follow us on Instagram and uh, on Twitter. I I try and post like behind the scenes stuff on Instagram a little bit. Uh, I, I Twitter exhausts me, so I'm not really posting much on there except for when the new episodes are if you're subscribed you know that already uh when the new episodes are be subscribed uh you're on youtube hit the bell or whatever i don't know (laughs) send us send us uh um 
recommendations for any old movies absolutely from the as we're as we're getting into this era of you know actually well-known feature films uh some recommendations on what would be good to watch are definitely welcome well with that uh glenn i will see you next year see you next year 